Why are you wearing those again? He's imitating Corey Hart. <laughs> hey, I look Corey badass. Hart. I still look badass with it, you gotta admit. It's cool. It definitely gives you that rad 90s look, of course. Although the Pikachu shirt could be a throw-off, but... <laughs> kind of diffuses it. No, you're, yeah. you're, a, you're a badass Pokemon trainer. <laughs> because exactly. of character, there's Last, there's Bugcatcher, Badass. That's a... <laughs> Punk, Biker, Fisherman. Gotta get me some less. <laughs> there can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello and welcome to Cinema Royale, where we have nards. Yes, kick us in the nards if you want to. We got nards. <laughs> I'm nardless. <laughs> I left the nards. Mine is still pending. Mine is a loading screen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what else? Would, what else can you explain my high pitched voice? <laughs> I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and let me introduce you to my awesome film officiatos. First up, we got Animat, no, no, known as Matt Brunet. Hey guys, when the full moon strikes, we are the ones that will most likely turn into little pugs. We will have a scary transformation, and then we're going to have doofy little cute faces. <laughs> we'll always be happy to see you. Up next is James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Too. Oh my god. It's horrifying. Ah! Tonight's broadcast oh, is brought to you by the East Bay Pumpkin Harvest Festival. I went there today and it was so much fun. I went to a jam. No, not and you then again. I went to. Oh, 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 oh. oh my gosh. Nice butter knife, by the way. <laughs> I'll show him to show up in my show again. Continue. Thank you. And last but not least, Can Sylvie, also known as Shame on Pretzel. Hello, everyone. Um, don't know much about werewolves. Tried to get in the werewolf spiller this time. Um, last time I wore the makeup, I guess the more accurate way to... Uh, disguise myself as a werewolf is just not to shave for a week. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> just a sparrow. So, there you go. I was about to say that, but I wanted to hold back. I was like, oh, okay, she did it for me. Good. <laughs> just one of the guys. So... Yeah, I'm already halfway there, so... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Thankfully, that's all he showed us. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, like I I'm had something else off. in mind. No. No, James, no. Oh. Or I can pull a guy on if you want. So. Yeah, I grow up with... I, come on, I wake up with hair on my chin every morning, too. Last time we talked about vampires, this time we might as well talk about their enemy? There's always been a vampires versus werewolves kind of thing, like team vampire or team werewolf. It's always, I don't know why it's versing. They always come together and fight each other. It's weird. It's well, weird. I guess it's for the title of Creature of the Night. Maybe. It could, 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 could be, could be. Um, so we're going to uh, talk about werewolf films, films that feature werewolves. Uh, as a, I asked these guys beforehand what the films are, and... <laughs> these guys have a lot of classics 
A lot of classics for you guys. Me? I got contemporary stuff, modern stuff. James has got one modern remake, but we'll get into that. And my stuff is fairly contemporary, but I, I still aim to surprise nonetheless. Hey, we would be surprised indeed. Uh, let's start with Matt. Hmm? Okay, well, I guess I'm the one to start because I'm the one that has the all-time classic. Tech, you could say this is the one that started it all, in a sense. This is the 1941 Universal Classic, The Wolfman. Now, the one thing I could say about The Wolfman is that when you watch it nowadays, it's not all that great because we've heard the story before. Like, this is the, the, the basic Wolfman story where you got this poor guy, you know, he doesn't mean any harm, he's just an average citizen, but then turns into a werewolf starts attacking and admittedly a lot of the effects are not are are pretty dated but there is one thing that really does make it a timeless classic is that yes nowadays this is kind of the generic wolf's uh wolf man story but like i said this is the one that started it all this is the one that set the standards um all the wolf stories uh, pretty much kind of put their basis on this. This is where we see the average citizen, where we see where we get into his psyche, mostly um, when, like when he comes to this realization that he has this beast inside of him. Um, we also got uh, also like even the transformation scenes, like often, like a lot of people just pull this off is just normally go like have the transformation happen on the side or something like that but this one actually has the balls to show it in front of our faces and this is like through dissolving and adding a little bit of makeup one at a time now this is something that hasn't been seen before in um cinema history and this took a lot of time just for applying the makeup and all that stuff and in a way it is kind of admirable and then there's also the performance of Lon Chaney Jr., which this pretty much launched his career as a universal horror actor. And, um, yeah, he pulls off this amazing performance, both as the regular citizen and also as the, as the Wolfman, which he ended up playing in several incarnations afterwards in many different um, crossovers, even in Abbott and Costello meets uh, Frankenstein, he ends up reprising his role as the Wolfman, and it really is um, it really is an interesting movie, like you know, and I and that's pretty much what I can say about it is that this is the one like you know the story, but it definitely is worth watching to see where it has its origins, where it has begun. Indeed, I'm. I. I. Uh, I'm gonna admit. I. I did. I didn't. Uh, I. I've never seen. Uh, this. Uh, this version of the Wolfman. However, I. I can say that I'm. I'm familiar with the. With the, stuff that you're talking about. Mainly the the makeup transformations where they had, dissolves going on. That sort of thing, it, it take it uh, it um, watching it as a kid. I I didn't quite uh, buy it when I when I saw a lot of uh, the spinoffs and and what have you. Mm -hmm. But I saw what they were trying to do, and there was just a, a hell of a lot of patience that went into into those scenes. It, it's pretty um, much it's pretty much an, an admiration of the technology back then. It's kind of like watching the Three Caballeros or Songs of the South nowadays, where it's really easy to try to blend live action with animation. That that's an easy thing to do, but back then it wasn't. So there is a sense of admiration of not only the technology that they the technology that they had, but the way they also executed. Um, with that technology. Mm. I, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I only know. I, I've only seen uh, 
Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, so that's where I'm I'm drawing my source of inspiration or I, knowledge here. But that's kind of like uh, saying that I I know Planet of the Apes after watching Spaceballs. Um, yeah. It's so. Hard. Yeah, this is. Well, they had. Well, they, the they had those types of effects, uh, just just go through over and over again, um, and later the effect was all uh, the transformation effect was also mimicked in uh, another Abbott and Costello film. Uh, I believe it was Abbott and Costello meet Doctor Jekyll in Mister Hyde. Maybe. Um, yes, and in that film, it's Costello that undergoes the uh, the werewolf transformation. Believe it or not. Yeah, I've personally have not seen the film either. So I, I know the tropes of the Wolfman. I know I'm familiar with the story. I just haven't seen it from front to end. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually uh, I did some research on werewolf films actually, and it's not. It's, oh, the Wolfman is like the one that starts off the tropes, you know, the silver bullet, you know, the transformation, uh-huh. all all the works of a mod of what um, werewolf films come to be to this day, because that's the source you go to. But that's not the first were- werewolf film in existence, or non-existent, because there was a werewolf film. They came out in 1910. It featured a Native American woman turning into a werewolf. And this footage is lost now. It's a lost movie, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can't see it now because it was iconic back in the day, but now it's gone forever. Yeah. But it's like, there you go. There's your history. Uh, the first werewolf film featured a female, not a male. So I guess it's, it, it's the similar case of Snow White where a lot of people think that's the first ever animated feature, but in reality, it's this, um, uh, there is this Argentinian film that did, that made one like almost 20 years before Snow White. I think it was called, uh, what was it? El, El, El Castrol or something like that. Um, yeah, but was it any good? That's the thing. Uh, I was wrong. 1913. I'm sorry, Cole. The Werewolf. <clears throat> yeah, it featured Native American werewolf. Uh, it's actually based on a, uh, a story, actually. So, no A Native clear. American woman who turns into a werewolf. Am I the only one who finds that hot? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, El Postal. There we go. Like, when the first one is El Postal, but nowadays, yeah. that... That one is lost. Yeah, so. so it's it's one of those cases. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess this is the one that really. Yeah, it really. That really got it mainstream. It really mainstream, like, bam! It's like every world film in existence has to reference it somehow, and I'll get into that when I come into my films because I it's, it's been referenced a couple of times. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So, and... yeah, the wolf. And that was our take. That was our take on the Wolfman. Awkwardly, awkwardly, transitioned to James Sullivan's film. Okay, well, the first, uh, my first werewolf pick film is uh, is one that I is one that I saw actually a couple of years ago. It is a remake of the Wolfman. And the distinction between this and the Lon Chaney Wolfman is that in Lon Chaney's universe, Wolfman is two words. In this film's universe, Wolfman is one word. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Mm-hmm. Now your mind is blown completely. What? what? Can they do that? Can they actually separate the words? Mm-hmm. They did not just do that. Oh my God! I am talking about the 2010 film *The Wolfman*, starring uh, Guillermo del Toro and Anthony Hopkins, 
two actors who actually don't need very much makeup to be Wolfmen. Oh. But, uh, but are fantastic in any case. Um, and... Is that Guillermo del Toro, actually? Oh, no, Benicio uh, del Toro. Benicio del Toro. Wrong del what Toro. What did I say? Guillermo del yeah, Toro. You said, you said the director, not the... Oh. <laughs> that Close enough. Bad. <laughs> The, the lovable, that the weird, lovable Del Toro that everyone loves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This, yeah is the, this... this is the weird, hairy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess, uh, I guess this, w- this is where I would have to um, watch the original Wolfman as a point of comparison, because while watching this, while watching this film, I get a, a completely different perspective which is not I'm not going to say it's bad I will say to an extent seen it um, in this uh, in this version we have uh, Benicio del Toro as our titular wolfman uh, he gets uh, he's uh, he has uh you're following the same story. He's going back to his ancestral homeland, and he is, uh, and he's bitten by a werewolf. But here is the thing: his his father is there too. His father, played by Anthony Hopkins, and um, it uh, surprise, surprise, uh, Benicio del Toro is not the only. Uh, one who turns into a werewolf in the film. It turns out the original werewolf was Anthony Hopkins. But, Ooh. yeah, what a twist. So, um... I eat people what... for a reason, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh my god. That was a horrible now, impression. I apologize. Now, while I, I, I admit that there were uh, the effects in this film are are really top notch. I find it interesting that, um, let's see here. I'm looking at the awards at this one. Uh, let's see. Excuse me. Best achievement in makeup. One, the Oscar. Yeah, I actually remember that year. Actually, I remember that. And I remember writing. I remember during the time that that this was leading up to the Oscars, I was actually writing a review on this and this is why I'm, I'm glad we had this discussion about uh, stop motion uh, uh, gluing, fi- gluing hair to the face because um, here we have that stop motion um, blend for lack of t- better terms I would say dissolving motion. because stop motion like that would be frame by frame mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you can't do that with a person with stop motion Oh, well, no. you can't like you can't use a person oh. as a puppet. Well, like they did in Sledgehammer. That me. It, it's yeah. very, it's, it's very, video. very tricky. It's very, You're it's very tricky. Him. Yeah, the people at Marvel did works. do a good job on that. I gotta admit. So anyway, we go from that type of werewolf transformation to this type of werewolf transformation, which is, uh, which is trying to go on and beyond uh, a certain. Uh, uh, a certain John Landis film, which uh, somebody else might mention, but I'll I'll keep the uh, the title uh, under the under the carpet for now. Um, and we have uh, we have Rick Baker getting the Oscar for best achievement in makeup. The reason why I find that interesting is because um. Did they did they actually judge him on his makeup job, or could they figure out between which was makeup and which was CGI? Hmm. Because you bet there was a buttload of CGI in that movie. Huh. And yeah. I, uh, I see he's got I see he's got somebody else listed here, David Dave Elsie. I don't know who that is, but. Um, if they're talk, if they're talking about, oh, he also does, if you know, he also does uh, 
uh, computerized makeup, well, then you might be able to make that argument. But but still, when I think makeup, I think actual fur on faces. Yep. So, um, yeah, the, the film itself was not... I'm not going to say it was scary. I, I will say it was kind of cheesy. The uh, The director is actually uh, Joe Johnston, who is a good director. Um, it uh, He did... Uh, he started out with such films as Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and The Rocketeer. Mm-hmm. Uh, later went to do Jumanji. And um, Jurassic Park 3, which uh, people are up and sort of... Eh, I, I mm-hmm. haven't seen, so I can't comment. Uh, and then The Wolfman, and, but uh, he follows up The Wolfman with Captain America. Mm-hmm. So that's proving yeah, that he so is still awesome. Yeah. Um, so, I, this film, uh, my, my reaction to here is, it, it's, uh, it's mind-blowing effects work, but I'm just sort of, sort of thinking of it as being, as being popcorn here. It's, a, it's the same type of familiar story. Um. It's an enjoyably dumb flick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like, okay, if you see it, see it. Um, and that's that's what I, I got. <laughs> just want to add, ask one question, James. So, uh, for Rick Baker, the the gentleman that did the makeup. So you're saying, are you saying they gave him the Oscar just because of who he is and the the work that he's done, or you just feel that um, maybe he was unfairly given the Oscar because CGI was implemented? Mm, no, I'm not. I'm not in sit in. in I'm not trying to say that there's uh, that he did not deserve the Oscar. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that can you is can can they uh, the can the Academy tell the difference between uh, what kind of makeup he worked on and what not? So it's like, I mean, he, Rick Baker is a is a damn good effect makeup effects artist. He uh, you know he did, he did nutty uh, professors. Yes, and every other Eddie Murphy movie that wasn't uh, that wasn't uh, Vampire in Brooklyn. That's true. So, so he's uh, he's high class, but this uh, this just sort of uh, had me a little bit confused. Is he is he uh, really deserving of the of the Oscar here, or did they just not know any better? I think he deserves the Oscar, but yeah. just the uh, the Academy just like doo, 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 doo. <laughs> it's makeup. Just give it to the guy that always wins. Yeah, two thousand mm. the two thousand ten Oscars were kind of a goofy year. I don't know. It just I don't know. It was a great year. Yeah, the Oscars are usually weird. So yeah, I have I just for further exploration in this episode, I have not seen any of the films you three have watched so I have no opinion Ditto. I have no opinions on them whatsoever it's here I was ignorant to all this so you won't hear anything from me when it comes to your <laughs> films I might heard of it I might not heard of it but that's the two cents I have right now Uh, Very well. well. The Wolfman, the Wolfman, and <laughs> what else do we got from Sylvie? Um, so I decided to the go Wolfman, old... all in one word. <laughs> it's the Wolfman, the Wolfman. Wolfman way or something like that. Yeah. Uh, lycanthrope, human hominid species thing. No. Um, so I, having not seen too many werewolf movies and I'm, again I'm going to spare everyone from doing the obvious choice that I could think of that I have seen which was Twilight I'm not going to do that nope. I went uh, <laughs> I went uh, classic for this one so um, Matt had mentioned the original movie The Wolfman um, I watched a I watched a similar movie that uh, came out in 
I think it was 1930, 1935. Um, it was called uh, Werewolf of London. So, so it's not a werewolf, like an American werewolf in London. It's just werewolf, uh, werewolf of London. I think it was. I don't want to say it wrong. Werewolf of London. Uh, yes. Ooh, werewolves of London. So it, it's a black and white film. Um, there's a main actor in it is Henry Hull mm-hmm. and Warner Olin. I don't know any of these people because I don't follow too much the silver screen era. But uh, so it's about this uh, botanist uh, that goes to Tibet, uh, Dr. Glendon. He goes to Tibet to find this rare flower. Um, and as he's searching for the flower, he gets attacked by a werewolf. Um, they have a scuffle. He gets scratched, but he, he ends up getting away okay. So he gets the flower and he brings it back to London because he's trying to make the, the flower bloom uh, without moonlight. He's trying to simulate uh, moonlight in order to make the buds on the flower bloom. So as this is going on, uh, he's neglecting his wife um, and uh, a childhood friend of the wife comes and they hit it off because uh, Dr. Glendon's so busy trying to get this plant to to bloom. He's doing all these re- all this research and it's not working. So another scientist approaches him and asks if he could see the flower and he explains to him that it's the only antidote for uh, ly- lycanthrope. I think it's lycanthropy or becoming a werewolf. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Glendon it's, obviously... Yeah? It's the antidote ly- of lycanthrope. It rhymes. Uh... Mm-hmm. Very good. Kudos, sir. So, yeah, so he tries to uh, get, uh, I think his name is Dr. Yo, I have to make a note, Dr. Yogami. Dr. Yogami wants to see the flower. Dr. Glendon declines. So uh, he realizes that, after a while, he realizes that he's starting to change. Like uh, animals are barking around him. They're getting all stressed out of shape. There's this cat that just goes like ape shit during the movie and his he notices that his hands are changing so he he injects himself with some of the the the, the venom or like the thorn from the flower because apparently he the research he's doing it can make the flower bloom but there's three buds on the on the flower only two open and the third one doesn't so he he injects himself with the first one he's okay so he, and he goes on with his research um, Dr. I keep forgetting his name, Dr. Yogami, he sneaks into the, uh, the laboratory and he steals the flowers since he can't, uh, since he won't, Dr. Glendon won't let him see it. So he has the one bud, uh, there's just one bud left for Dr. Glendon and he's trying to get it to, to, um, to bloom, but this one's stubborn and it only will react to natural moonlight and the moon's not coming for another three days. So without the flowers, he's transforming into uh, like the sort of he actually is like like a werewolf, uh, kind of similar to uh, the same sort of dissolving transformation and everything. That's in the movie too. So mm. again, I could I could see that having not seen the Wolfman, I I read there's a lot of comparisons to the Wolfman in this, mm-hmm. and it coming out in the 30s, I find that interesting. So the movie is basically the standard, you know, he turns into the wolf man, he kills a person, he cloisters himself away, doesn't work, he goes out, he kills a person. Eventually people find out that he's uh, he's this, uh, the wolf man guy, they uh, hunt him down, and, you know, it ends as any, I guess, typical werewolf movie would, um, in tragedy. So it, it, mm. it I, like, not having too much experience in monster movie films, I, I enjoyed that one, the acting was good. Um, you can see the you can see like the plot twist coming from a mile away with uh, between Doctor uh, Yokami or Yugami and the Doctor Glenn and like plot twist Doctor Yugami actually was the werewolf that scratched him in the beginning and that's why he wanted the flowers. So, uh, but I, I think it's uh, again I, I don't really have any movie to compare it to. I haven't seen any iteration of the Wolfman. But uh, I think that was a, a good one to start with, like, if you want to try, so, like, something different. So 
the Universal Wolfman wasn't the first no, werewolf movie. I was going to say, I didn't know. This is the first one, mainstream werewolf movie. <clears throat> this is the first mainstream werewolf, werewolf movie. Yep. Kurt? And it didn't use any silver bullets. Um, no, it was just actually it was a regular bullet, but it just ended. The guy came in, a cop came and shot him, and that was it. Ah. So sil- silver oh, bullets weren't implemented nope. yet. There's no. The Wolfman implemented the uh, silver bullet. Oh it wasn't, boy! Yeah, this wolf wasn't really. This isn't a wolf that is uh, inspired by sort of like, I guess. It's not, a, it's not a more supernatural werewolf. It's like literally the kind of werewolf where a person just turns into a wolf in a sense essentially yeah they they make they they make the implication that even though he's a like a wolf like like humanoid he has the ten i think the the phrasing they take is that he he's neither man nor wolf he's a beast that embodies like the worst of both both man and beast he's like a like dr like dr dr glendon's dr jekyll and his like wolf form is mr hyde in wolf Mm. form but, uh, yeah, so it's more of a biological kind of werewolf. But it could be killed easily, hence the bullet. Mm-hmm. Ah, so... Even a good werewolf movie bends the, the rules just a little bit. Yes, it does. Hmm. Because uh, I'm pretty sure the whole silver bullet thing came before even the wolfman. Uh, that's... Yeah, maybe. Maybe we should... Somebody should figure that out. When did the fucking okay. silver bullet come out? Um, ben the... Write down on the, com- on the comments below, where the frick did those silver bullets come from? <laughs> First one to answer will be uh, get a shout out on the podcast. And a free t-shirt. They, com- they came, they were first seen flying out of Stephen King's a-hole. <laughs> they were first seen in Maine. Through a drunk, through a drunk priest. Okay. Yes. Bending the rules. Okay. Let's go back 30 years in 1984. <clears throat> Actually, a little, little backstory on this. I had so many uh, first film ideas for for this podcast. Uh, I remember watching a film called Blood and Chocolate. Uh, it's <clears throat> based on a book. It came out seven years ago. Don't remember that. Um, but then I found a film called Werewolves on Wheels. That came out in 1971. It's basically <laughs> a biker film mixed with a cult kind of film. It didn't have any werewolves in the film per se. It just the dumbest movie I've ever seen. Actually, it's just a straight up biker film. And um, basically, the girlfriend gets like uh, has like a satanic you know ritual over her and she becomes this creature at one point and I was like this thing in a werewolf movie fuck this shit <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm petting him petting him like okay what film should I talk about what film should I talk about so I'm just researching research and I'm like wait a minute this film I have on file and it's a 1984 Spanish horror film called Monster Dog now you think mm. of the title Monster Dog you'd like this ain't a werewolf film it's a killer dog film for crying out loud it's a Cujo movie. <laughs> it's a Cujo movie. Um, cause I, I, cause I, I was researching for a series I'm working on called Double Creature Feature, where I talk about creature features and pit them against each other. And Monster Dog came up, and I was like, oh, this is a killer dog film. I'll just keep this on file and watch it later. And I come to realize it's a werewolf film. Um, like I said, it's a Spanish horror film. It's I watched the English dub, of course. It's uh, it's on YouTube actually. It's a uh, VH. VHS rip, uh, English dub, like I said, because the person who stars in it didn't uh, dub his own voice in for the English version, and that person is Alice Cooper. Al Cooper <laughs> is in this film. So yes, but it's not automatically makes it awesome. <laughs> yes, yes, you can see him act, but he's it's not his voice. It's somebody else dubbing his own voice, which kind of fits his character in a way. Um. So, Al Cooper's plays Vincent, who is a pop star. You know, kind of think that, you know, Al Cooper's a rock star. So, it's like, you kind of had to get used to him being a pop star, you know, trying to hear him limp sync to this pop song. Oh, Alice Cooper is playing Alice Cooper. 
in a way, in a way, not 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 to extent. He's 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 semi. He's like really popular musician, and he's a pop star, not a rock star. Uh, and so he uh, he and, he and his friends go back to uh, well. The film opens up opens up with a, a music video, <laughs> so you see <laughs> him performing a song, and I'm like, okay, this is a like, nice song. Okay, let's just get started. Okay. So. After that, they, he, Vincent and his pals go to his childhood home to shoot another music video there at his childhood home. And it's, it's a welcome home party. There's caretakers there setting everything up. And, of course, in that area, there's a, a pack of wild canines attacking. Of course. So it's like, okay, this is a killer dog film at first. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah a pack of wild dogs. Sure, sure. Why not? Um... So, and then Vincent comes by, and, you know, it's like, where's the caretaker? You know, they realize he's been ripped to pieces by the dogs. And the monster dog, as quoted in the title, is actually the werewolf. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't see the monster dog that much. It's, like, very hidden, very suspenseful and mysterious. Like you see, you see it the first time in the woods where Vincent and his girlfriend go out and see what's, what the noises are, and they get spooked. They go in their van and go to their to the home. Uh, it's you don't see the wo- monster dog until later on in the film, but in between it, you see the other characters having nightmares about uh, Vincent uh, becoming a werewolf, and and then. People are like, eh, eh, werewolf, yeah, let's go hollow the moon, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, right, I don't think Vincent's gonna be a werewolf. Turns out his father was a werewolf. Throughout his childhood, his father was picked at, you know, with pitchforks and hunting down. I think his neighbors at one point shot him down with a silver bullet, and I guess it, it kind of runs... I wasn't too sure if it run in the family, so I wasn't too sure he's going to turn into a werewolf at one point. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for Alice Cooper to turn into a werewolf at one point. And I'm like, where is it? Damn it, where is it? But, um... he lo- Now, here's the reference I'm talking about when it comes to Wolfman. He opens up a book about werewolves. There's a shot of the book, and there's a picture of Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman. Mm-hmm. What? That's subtle. <laughs> That's very subtle. It's like, just a clear shot. It's like, oh, Lon Chaney Jr.'s in here. I was like, the picture. It's like, okay, okay, the Wolfman's in canon, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how. It's, I guess, it's in the freaking universe. So, the film is kind of mysterious where you don't know if this is the werewolf or not because you don't because his group of friends are curious because he often disappears and you don't see him until later on and in between him leaving is people dying so you don't know if he's the one leading the the wild dogs or not but the monster dog towards the end ho 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 the climax is just amazing the monster dog comes out of nowhere <sighs> it's glorious <laughs> It's actually, I think it's a puppet, actually, I believe. It's very, you know, go... Ah, no! Because, <laughs> so... you see, it comes, through the... it comes through the front door at one point. It goes... It's like a sock puppet, then? With it's, hair? It's, like, more matured than that. It's, like, a very... But you don't see it as you don't see it because it's in the shadows and in the dark. So you kind of think it's like a foam kind of scary puppet. It's, it, if you see the poster for Monster Dog, or actually if you watch the movie, there's actually uh, a portrait on the wall. You kind of see the portrait of the Monster Dog on the portrait. Um, but it's very creepy. If you, it's very suspenseful. It's very mysterious. It got me into it. Uh, Spoilers towards the end. Alice Cooper does turn into a werewolf, <gasps> but the the transformation. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's it's really not that good. It's it's they start they start doing it and then they're just like, he's like, telling his girlfriend, show me, show me, show me. 
Just kill me before I turn into a werewolf. Kind of reminds me of Thriller. It's like suddenly you see Michael Jackson is like he, during his transformation, and then suddenly you see him all big googly eye. Go out now! Does, uh, technically, uh, Michael Jackson turned into a were cat. Ah, uh, sure. Uh, the same were. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's different were species. There's were cats. There's were hyenas. Technically the same, it, except more hysterical. Yeah, the, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> does uh, uh, does Alice Cooper uh, get a chance to feed his Frankenstein? <laughs> it, it, no, I don't believe so. <laughs> like I said, he's just this character who is linked into with uh, being a werewolf. You know, the neighbors. Um, this, oh, this neighbor, he's got he's very kooky. He's just like, you yeah, know, I got this gun right here. It's got a silver bullet in it. And I'm going to shoot him right in the heart. Convenient. I'm going to go shoot damn werewolf right in the heart. I'm a werewolf hunting. I'm going to go That's what they... and sell some werewolves. That's what they call it now. Let's go, boys. And he's got like a posse too. He's just he's like, come on. <laughs> Watch the door. Don't let him come in. Okay. Tell me when he comes in. All right. All right. Wait. Now you gotta open the door when I say so, and I'll shoot. All right. Wait for it. Wait for it. No, bang! If y'all want, I even did a rendition of Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, but more in our style, you know? <laughs> and then they're so drunk, they realize they didn't shoot a werewolf at all. It's just someone's overweight aunt with a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the story, actually. In Monster Dog, you know, there's the plot point where these two, this, this guy and his posse, you know, tries to kill Vince because he thinks there's a werewolf, and you know, um, uh, Vincent bangs on the door like, guys, guys, let me in. And all the bad guys are actually having all the the friends all tied up and, you know, like, shh, don't, don't, don't say anything. So, so. Well, the, the, no, he's one of them werewolves. Don't, 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 shh, So, so they assume. You got that right, two fingers. <laughs> don't worry, I got my eye on him. <laughs> So, so, they assume that Vince is still at the door, banging, but it's actually a girl named Maria. And he says, I'll be right back. See ya. And all of a sudden, okay, okay. ready? Go. Bang. Shoots the girl by accident. Oh, man. It sucks. Oh, it's just, there's a lot of, oh, there's blood and guts. There's a lot of attacking by the monster dog and gunshots. It's, there's, it's, it's a very good 80s movie. It's got Alice Cooper in it for crying out loud, and it's an English dub, so you gotta expect you know crazy, you know mouth movements, kind of not Japanese like dubbing, but it's just I, I never watched an English dub movie before. I just thought it was just weird watching English dubbed. So when you watched uh, when you watched the girl banging on the door, were you thinking she's scraping at the door, <laughs> scraping at the door? <laughs> Scraping out the door! Scraping at the door! <laughs> if you don't let me in, I'm gonna let the werewolf out. <laughs> nice. I... <laughs> now that would've been... That's great. <laughs> I never thought about that. Okay, yeah, if, if you guys are really interested in a good, mysterious killer dog slash werewolf kind of film with Alice Cooper, you gotta check out Monster Dog. It's actually on YouTube. I don't know, God knows for how long, but it's you can check it out with it there. We come mm. and we come full circle back to Matt. Yes. Funny it's funny that you mentioned that there is uh, that you mentioned a uh, an English dub of a movie. Now 
Mine is actually from another country, and I saw the English dub of it. Interestingly enough, I originally wanted to talk about this in the vampire episode, because this, this seemed to be a lot more fitting in there. But I still had that feeling. It was like, I really want to see this movie. I really want to know what's, what it is about. And since there are werewolves in it, um, now it's a good time. Like, I can still be able to watch it and talk about it. So, like, me viewing this would not be in vain. So, I am talking about the 1985 Japanese animated flick, Vampire Hunter D. Uh, Vampire Hunter D, I gotta say, is that uh, the story itself really is interesting. I can really see where it, it has a following. Since it is based on a Japanese novel, or I think there was also a manga before it, where you pretty much see um, this vampire hunter named D, which is why it's called Vampire Hunter D. <laughs> but anyways, um, D is just walking about, and then there's this girl named Doris. Um, hold on, let me just get the IMDb page just to make myself clear with the names. I'm just going to make sure they're right. Uh, yeah, they're, yeah, and her name is Doris. Um, she got bitten by this, this major like King Vampire, who is known to be as Count Lee. Now, the thing is that um, the whole plot is that um, D was Count hired Lee. in order to protect Doris, but he has an idea to go out and actually kill off um, Count Lee. The, what's really interesting is that this is going to be the closest thing that anyone will, that we will possibly ever have to have a Castlevania movie because it really does have the same feeling of it. You got this badass main character pretty much fighting off all these different um, universal monsters because Count Lee's assistance mostly comes from, you know, we got the werewolves, we got um, we got Frankenstein's monster that is also accompanied by this little like Igor thing. And, like, you got harpies, you got snake women, uh, you got, well, I don't know about harpies, but definitely snake women. And you get all these, uh, like, demons and monsters and all that stuff. And you get all, all these different things. So one of the biggest aspects is mostly uh, through the creativity of the story and the character design. And all they even implement um, Count, uh, have Count Dracula, which in here is like the Jesus of uh, of all the vampires, I gotta say. No, well, no, because like they pray, they pray to him. Like they act it, like Dracula is like their lord, and and they make it clear that he does ex that Dracula did exist at one point. Um, the one thing that it does fall flat though is that yes, it can have a cult following. But I don't think this is the best adaptation of it because, number one, the animation is pretty low quality. Like, like sure, some of the designs are really cool, but it's no real different than what you would get in something like Dragon Ball Z or Yu-Gi-Oh! And, mm. like, the animation is really, like I said, it, it's, like, really low, limited animation quality. So, um, it, there, like, it, like... It's definitely done better in something like Akira or the Studio Ghibli movies or even Ghost in the Shell. Um, also, another thing, if you guys want to watch it, whenever you can, remember this advice. Please watch the Japanese dub because, oh god, the English dub is horrendous. The actors are just terrible. Like, there are some that are not that bad, but some like Doris and her little brother... They can't act for crap. Oh God, it's it's just terrible. And another thing I want I want to add is that um, there are some concepts where it does sound a little bit stupid, uh, or it's like completely weird even for this movie. Like for example, D actually has this assistant. Well, I don't know how, if I could say assistant, but. There's, like, whenever you would see D alone, you would hear his voice. There's, this, like, another voice that he would talk to. Mm -hmm. And there was at one point I was thinking, oh, maybe it's, like, a spirit in his sword. 
<laughs> no. You know what it is? Yeah, James, you saw Vampire Hunter D. I and saw it, Vampire I... Hunter D Bloodlust, so uh, I get okay. Uh, okay. Is this By the Pan? Way, Oh, yeah, and it has a face on it, just saying. So it's like Parasite, then, kind of. In a way. But, yeah, he's he's got, like, some kind of sass-talking hand and stuff like that. Oh, and also, then there's Count Lee for his reasons, because he, in a way, Count Lee is written a lot like Dracula in his story, in, in like, the Bram Stoker story. Like, he, like he would go out, like... He falls in love with Doris, and he wants to make her his wife. The reason? Oh, my God. Okay. He's ten. Th- he's like over 10,000 years old. And because of that, he often gets bored. <laughs> so from time to time, he's like, eh, give me a human. I'll, I'll make love to it, and then eh, I'll shrivel her to death. It'll suck all her blood. All right, next one. <laughs> so he's just a bored count. And that's... And, like, sometimes there are just a few things that are not really well thought of. <laughs> so, it, the pro, so, like, the problem could have been completely solved if you give freaking Count Lee a hobby. Just so, like... Give him something to do. Make a house of cards. Go read a book. Maybe start going a podcast. Out, going out swinging and have sex with white with not white chicks. I mean like with human <laughs> chicks. <laughs> Don't worry. Hey, I'm sorry. Count Lee sex with human bed. chicks. Silly. Don't worry. Count me would take love to you too. Don't worry. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Count makes love to everybody, don't you know? <laughs> so, yeah. He just, Count really just needs a freaking hobby. But other than that, I will say it is still worth a watch if you want, like, an, like if you want a good action packed Halloween flick. Like, if you want to have, like, some kind of anime flick, uh, anime fix, like, the action can definitely give you that. And a lot of the designs are very creative. And, yeah, that, that's pretty much what I could say with Vampire D, uh, Vampire Hunter D. Not the greatest um, Halloween animated feature. Not the greatest Japanese animated flick. But still something that's worth a watch. I'm not going to say I regret watching it. Mm-hmm. So, what would you think if they made it live action? Hmm. That would be interesting. Is, is it? Are they? That's, that's what I heard as well. Really? Hollywood's Was notorious the... for effing up oh, yeah. animes, though. No, because I'm just recently hearing the news about Ghost in the Shell yeah, and how they're, yeah, um, scheduled they're actually getting... That I want to see. I love... Ghost in the Shell. It's such an awesome movie. I even I like the sequel as, sequel as well, even if I don't really understand it. <laughs> just a just a thought I put out there. A live action vampire D. That actually sounds interesting. Who would play well, the can, vampire? I can see it work. Yeah, who would I you see it work. Who would you cast as vampire D? Va- uh, D. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, good question. Yeah, who, who would who would who would be the perfect D? Johnny D. Yep. No. No. Matt's, Matt's got... Matt wants... Christian Bale. Ooh. Oh, Christian Bale. Ooh. Not bad. Oh. oh, and there's another thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, and because this is about werewolves, I better add into what what the fridge are, are werewolves was, doing in here. I was just say, yeah, where's the werewolves? <laughs> okay, the, okay, the thing with werewolves is that, like I mentioned... Um, werewolves are pretty much one of the minions of um, Count Dracula because, like, um, no, not Dracula, I mean um, uh, Count, Count Lee. Lee because he has all those universal monster minions and one of them is a werewolf. And apparently, um, there was a mention that Doris's father was apparently a werewolf hunter, like how D was a vampire hunter. So, like, I, I guess, like, it kind of... 
brings up an interesting aspect to this to the world of Vampire Hunter D where um, like these universal monsters are kind of an issue in there and like they got and they got these separate groups of people who are specialized to go and attack them and one of them was a werewolf hunter so it, it does make uh, an interesting anecdote like I would like to see um, they, they should actually make like a spin-off to see like werewolf hunt to like some kind of like werewolf hunter C or something D plus vitamin C <laughs> werewolf hunter <laughs> Yeah, that'd be interesting. So yeah, that's the inclusion. But the, um, the one th- one important thing I want to mention, actually, like just to go back to the vampires, mm-hmm. is that um, uh, there's actually another concept where they got half breeds in there, which is half human, half vampires. As you know, like Count Lee mm-hmm. uh, did a lot of wi- women, so uh, eventually there's a lot of uh, uh, fudge. Where was I going? They a call lot him of the Daywalker. No, they call no. They're not daywalkers. They're called dampiers, where they're pretty much half human. But then, like it happens when, like when the time is right, when they have that urge, they will become a vampire. Like their vampire side will come up. So the, like they kind of have the a bit of the powers and immortality of a vampire, but they can restrain themselves to keep themselves human at all times. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. I would watch it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of anime films, James got one. Oh yes. Before before we dive into into mine, I'd like to really quickly usher in a a story about something uh, I'm gonna call here uh, a runner's up. I say runner up because I almost actually watched this all the way through. Um, I'm scouring Netflix looking for werewolf movies and I come across something called Moon of the, Moon of the Wolf from 1972 uh, story here is uh, in some uh, some old town there's uh, some small town area country-ish area there's a dead a young girl's dead body shows up pretty well shredded like she's been a, attacked by a wild monster or at least how shredded they can show on television, and uh, there, what that starts going from an investigation of murder to an investigation, a uh, no wait, vice versa, investigation of a wild animal attack to to murder, and looks it, it starts to look like a werewolf did it. Uh, and there's uh, there's also talk about who might have gotten her pregnant, but uh, here's the thing. You look at the link that I sent down there, and you yeah. you take a look at this uh, take a look at the front cover of this movie. It looks pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks well, great. Uh, mm-hmm. so I'm <laughs> I'm here to tell you that my goodness, that is false advertisement right there. <laughs> actually, while you showed me that, um, I actually found another photo like on Moon of the Wolf, and it's quite the opposite because. You're because like I was just struck there. Why the fridge does that guy look familiar? Uh, <laughs> and to top it off, I bet that's nowhere in the film. <laughs> oh hi Lon, you in this movie? No, then why the fridge are you in the poster, huh? <laughs> Wait, it gets better. I found out the hard way while watching it that it is a TV movie. Ow. Oh, I'm sorry. How did I find this out? Oh, well, let's see. You know how when you watch a TV movie that's been released to video, they have those moments where it fades to black mm-hmm. yeah. for a few seconds yep. and then it goes back up again? Yep. Oh. Yep. This had that. Only... A title came up saying, Place commercial here. (laughs) Are you serious? Insert commercial here. Are you serious? 
This is seriously a thing. I use faith. I've never seen that in a TV movie before. I have never seen that. Wow. Oh my god, that's bad editing. And they stuck that on Netflix. Yes. Oh, wow. It's like, oh yeah, everybody can see it now. (laughs) Oh my god. Yes. You're supposed to cut that stuff out before you stick it on even video. Do you ever watch the movies before you. Do they instinct? decorate cool. the, the sign that, that says insert commercial here? <laughs> Do they put uh, the, so the tiny wolf? Like those no, projects they didn't even dis- you make your own commercial. <laughs> no, they weren't even clever with it. They just they just put the bland text, place commercial here. It's it's like uh, it, it's like the real missing gags from from Grindhouse, only it doesn't realize it's a gag. <sighs> so that's my runner-up story. Okay, that's good. Okay, James, I have, I actually have one question. Hmm. Would you expect in the future that the cinema snob would look at this film? Quite possibly. I mean, it's okay. that dull of a werewolf film. I didn't even get to see any werewolves. I was halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that that kind of ex- that would explain the quality. Just to know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I just I just wanted to add the the picture that Matt had put with the wolf man. It almost looks like he's pointing at the the dog, and he's like, "That's my bitch." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right, right there. Right. Oh, oh, sorry. No, sorry, no, no this is all... for a Nintendo cartridge. No, no, no. This is the word. No, this is the wolf man going. It's like, oh, I'm not in this movie. That would be this guy right here. <laughs> Anyways, the actual movie that James chose. No, that guy down here is from the gray. Uh, but anyway, um, the actual movie I chose was Wolf Children, an anime film from two years ago and uh, I believe I was gonna want to I believe I was gonna try and actually watch this with uh, with uh, Matt uh, if he was if he was up for it but that was that was a while back I only got in touch with Morgan Mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, funny enough he loves this movie so you should have seen this this conversation we had I'm going to tell you a little bit about the movie first before I dive into that. Mm-hmm. Um, Wolf Children is the anti-werewolf movie. Hmm. Or at least I consider it to be the anti-werewolf movie. Interesting. Why is that? Well, let's see. Uh, remember what I told you about a vampire movie bending the rules? Yep. Usually makes it better. Well, here's the here's the werewolf type movie that completely breaks the rules, but somehow makes it work. We typically have uh, a perception of werewolf films in in uh, in our conscious, and that's uh, there's there's usually two types of werewolves. Uh, typically, the the wolf man, played by Lon Chaney, is a, is a sympathetic character. A guy gets bitten, nice guy turns into a monster once a, once a night every month, that sort of thing, or maybe for a couple of nights. And uh, that's uh, or sometimes we have werewolves that are werewolves by by heritage that uh, do not go by the name Del Toro. <laughs> um this is the latter sort of the this is the latter form of werewolf but it is not a horror movie mm-hmm. it is far from it um in this film we it starts out as a as a love story a young girl's this uh this uh young woman is going to go into college she meets a guy who's sitting in on some classes Thinks he's kind of cute, goes out on a few dates with him, and falls deeply in love with him. And guess what he is? He is a wolf. But here's the. Well, here, yeah, just 
just a wolf. This is not. Uh, this is not a. Uh, you know, he's uh, becoming a half man, half wolf, or anything special like that. But he literally turns into a wolf. Now they specifically say in the film that that you know what the uh, uh, the the movies that you see with with werewolves and whatnot being monsters that's all Hollywood stuff. But this is uh, this is how this movie sets up uh, uh, wolves. They're just um, and this is a movie that gets a uh, gets away with ha- having werewolves that are just normal people that turn into wolves. So what happens? Well, they get married. They have kids. They have two children. And early on in the film, she find uh, the uh, the mother uh, finds out that her that her husband uh, turned into a wolf and got hit by a truck. Oh. So. Th- and th- and this is a very this is not you know meant to be a a funny moment or in and even in the slightest I mean they pull this off like wow the it it's raining heavily out but as soon as as soon as she sees uh, as soon as she finds him you know she sees them just loading his loading his body into a bag everything every sound just tunes out just total silence. Soaking in the moment. Mm. Yeah, she, and even showing her going up and trying to. They they don't sh- they don't give you what she's trying to tell you to the to the garbage man that's taking the body away, but uh, you you know what she's going through. So now she's trying to the rest of the film, and this is the majority of the film is trying to raise two children. By her own, by herself, with very, with a very unique talent, you know, they um, these are children that uh, just happen to be able to turn into wolves at the same time, and this this uh, this raises a lot uh, a lot of very unique difficulties and. And puts her puts her actually in, into some some uh, some unique situations. Like there's one point where one of her kids gets sick, and so she's running down to the to the hospital, and she stops in front of the clinic, and she's hold yeah she's holding her uh, she's holding her son in her arms, and she looks up at at the clinic, and she stops. She looks across the street and looks, and there's a vet right across the street. <laughs> so she's looking back and forth between these two, like thinking, "Oh, uh, what, what should I do?" <laughs> you know, she promised her husband that she'd that uh, that she'd never let uh, the secret get out that there that there are wolves among them still. So. Uh, how does she deal with it when, if she goes into a clinic and suddenly, when her kid's in the waiting room, he turns into a wolf or something like that? Uh, it's a a very it's a humorous and a serious situation at the same time. But it, that's that's more or less the first half of the film. the uh, The remainder of the film is the kids growing up. Or at least showing them grow up to the ages of ten and twelve, respectively. Um, at which point, by that point, they're they become more of the focus of the story. But what I find interesting is why I call this the anti-werewolf movie. Um, when you have when you have the Lon Chaney werewolf, he he's a normal guy who turns into a werewolf who's who is an a uh, an embodiment of the monster that can't be controlled? In this film, the kids are turning back and forth between kids and wolves, and even visually, this is where the animation works out so nicely. Here, you can 
tell that there is no difference between uh, between the the kid and the wolf. I guess they're trying to say kids are little animals, but uh, <laughs> nice allegory. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know the uh, the the daughter is like four years old at one point, and she's going talking to her mom as a as a kid. She's like, "Mommy, I want to go for a walk. I want to go for a walk, mommy. I want to go for a walk, mommy. I want to go for a walk." And suddenly she's it just sort sort of sort of turning into a wolf at that point. You know, like she's <laughs> but still talking English, you know. Even though it's a Japanese movie. Huh. Um and there there are so many points in this film where that side of the of the the film uh sort of takes a holiday and they show certain scenes that are scenes that you you would actually just see in any other movie you know she's trying to move into a new house trying to plant some try, the mom's trying to plant some uh some food in the garden trying to raise the garden when her kids get old enough they send she sends them off to school and this is where this is where i think anime differentiates a lot from western animation because there are a lot of anime films i've seen like up on poppy hill where you can just see you can just see uh, normal, everyday things happening. Hmm. Um, Western animation, it always has to be big, like Book of Life big. Hmm. So, uh, but by the end of the film, the uh, the kids have to at, have a, a point that they need to reach, and I'm not going to give too much away, but the the conflict comes into play they know that they're humans and they know that they're wolves but the decision comes into play um, should you be one or should you be the other but eh, and because in this uh, in this in the universe of this film it's pulled off it, it, they are both pretty much one and the same and interestingly enough, the it uh, the the choices to go and choose one's own way in life, as depicted in the film, come across just as natural as trying to choose your own way in life in reality. So here we have. So that's why I think this is unique. And this is why this is why actually Morgan and I were were fighting for this because when I texted him one night I said uh, we're doing werewolf movies for the next podcast would you like me to uh, would you like to watch Wolf Children with me tonight and he comes back at me and he says that is not a werewolf movie <laughs> <laughs> that is a movie with wolves that adopts Kitsune mythology in and, and he had this this whole spiel going, and it was it was all it was quite over the top and humorous to watch. And I was just like, oh my goodness, I wish that he was still here with us doing these podcasts sometimes oh, because yeah. it'd be great to see. Wouldn't it be great to see his reaction here? Uh, and <laughs> no, I, we need, no, 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 no. We need to bring Morgan here, watch the video, then we'll see the, all the fun in the comments. Or maybe go on Facebook, make a little vlog out of it. Mm -hmm. That'll be. I mean, he, I mean, he had va valid points. Werewolf movies have a, a distinct set of rules and tropes. You know, they, uh, they go by the they go by the the Wolfman uh, mythos. This film mm. does not, and that's why I call it the anti werewolf movie because it takes everything you think you know, throws it out the window, and makes a story that works. So like, I can, but like. This would be more of a kitsune movie, I guess. Like Inuyasha, almost mixed with Slice of Life. That's that's mm -hmm. what I'm vibe I'm getting from it. Mm. Yeah, it, it it is, it's, it's a, a a dash of fantasy, to to throw in with your somewhat realistic real life story. I I found it quite fascinating, so I rec I I recommend it to people. 
Mm-hmm. Good, because I want to see that. I really wanted mm-hmm. to see that one, actually. Yeah. It's actually really interesting when you mentioned um, the differentiation, the uh, the di- the big difference between uh, Japanese animation and Western animation. Mike, what the fridge are you doing? <laughs> uh, anyways, no, it, it really is interesting when you mention that because uh, looking at Wolf Children, hearing the premise and all that stuff, it really captures that um, Studio Ghibli style in a sense. Um, like because like. Studio Ghibli often they would do like those little slices of life movies that would have a little bit of um, of a fantasy element and make it a little bit whimsical. Mm. Uh, the best example I could find is uh, My Neighbor Totoro, where we mostly see um, it's the uh, Sasuke and Mei pretty much living their average little lives in their home um, in their new home while mm-hmm. their mom while their mom is sick on the side. But then they encounter the spirits of the forest, which is pretty much Totoro and the little dust bunnies. I think they're little dust bunnies or something. I don't know. They look like bunnies. But anyways, yeah, Wolf Children, um, it does have this interesting sense of, um, like, I can see where the werewolf aspect would come in play. Like, like even when you look at the, at the photos, like when you see the little kids uh, just being cute little wolves Uh, anyways uh, like you see the little wolves like you don't think like oh my god werewolves scare you like you just see it it's like that's your senpai (laughs) big googly anime eyes yeah like yeah exact hold on yeah let me show you this this is exactly what I mean like this is exactly what I mean And, what um, happened? Let's see. Mm-hmm. See the little wolfies. Aww, look at oh, look at that. This is a, this is a, this is a point in the film where they're, they're sort of figuring out, um, uh, figuring out the ropes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but it really is. Um, yeah, I could definitely like. I remember when you and Morgan were freaking out about this film, and I did get some requests uh, to do it for Animax Classic Reviews, and I could definitely see it. Um, I could definitely see where it can have its following. I'm actually pretty surprised that it's not made by Studio Ghibli, since it does incorporate its style into it. It, it really is uh, an interesting flick, so um, definitely, I, um, maybe I'll give it a watch. I'll, I'll admit. Uh, I will confess, I'm not too big on those slice of life movies, but maybe when I when I'll get the chance, I'll see how it goes. Okay, put it in your hat, please. <laughs> I, I think I did. I'll have, let me let me just check. I think I did. He's gonna double check it. I I have an entire list. I mean, with all the requests that I get. Maybe. Uh, let's I'll see. Pick it up next time. Coming soon. Yes, I do have it. Okay, oh, good. I have it. Good, good, good. Uh, I never know with all the things that people suggest me. So let's uh, keep the werewolf right. train going with uh, Sylvie's next classic werewolf movie. Okay, Mike, I saw you flash the the timer. You said fifteen minutes, right? So I'm gonna I'll try to keep it brief because this is a it's not really a movie that I liked. The second movie was not good. Okay. Um, this was uh, this one came out I think a little later, 1961. Uh, curse. It's called The Curse of the Werewolf. So this was actually the first movie I watched of the two. Um, it starts in Spain uh, for some reason. Um, it never really has that Spain vibe because a everyone's speaking in English. They all seem to have an English accent, and no one really looks Spanish. But they sprinkle in "señor" and "señorita" to kind of give it that feeling. But you know, it, 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 who are they fooling? So the movie starts with this beggar man. He's going around trying to find some food. He walks into this like marquee. I guess he's kind of like a king or like a an important politician. He walks into uh, his uh, house during a feast for their wedding because the marquee just got married 
So the Marquis making a fool of him. He's making him dance for chicken scraps and giving him wine to get him all drunk and soused up. And then he throws him in the dungeon afterwards just for the lulls. So he's in there, and then they forget about him. Uh, he, he ends up getting, like, old and feral. Um, the only people that see him are the, the jailer that feeds him and his daughter that's mute. She can't speak. So, you know, they, they have some sort of rapport. Like, the, the, the beggar winks at the daughter. I don't know if that's foreshadowing for what happens later, because the jailer dies, uh, the mute daughter becomes busty mute daughter, and she's the one that ends up feeding him, and then also becoming, like, the chambermaid for the marquis, who's now also old and decrepit. So he makes a pass at her. She, she bites him. He gets mad. She throws him in the cell with the with the beggar so at first you're thinking okay like they're friends he's not going to harm her or anything but like no he like pretty much ravages her and like ends up at first i wasn't sure it looks like okay did he turn into a werewolf while he was in there for like 30 years but no he just he just sees her saw saw how she was and then just like raped her essentially so then they kick her out and then so they send her to get to go get i guess raped by the marquee but before he can make it, uh, pass, uh, touch her, she stabs him and then runs off. So she runs off and she lives in the forest for a few months. And then uh, this guy, uh, Don Alfredo, he finds her just like floating in the water. Like she's alive, but she's just like floating there for no reason. I guess she can't scream. So she's like, well, fuck it. So then um, they bring her home. Uh, they find out she can't talk. They also find out she's pregnant. So they, uh, they, um, Don Alfredo and his sister take care of her. Um, but Does the she sister's have both also. Children? Uh, get into that. Get into that. <laughs> the sister, the sister's worried because she's like, I don't want this kid to be born on Christmas because that's the birthday of our Lord and they don't play that and he's, it's, she's going to be cursed. So of course, you know, of course she has it on December 1st, of course, or December 25th, I should say. So she dies. Uh, the mute daughter, the mute woman, dies during childbirth, and they have this kid. So Don Alfredo and, and the sister have to take care of the kid. So fast forward to uh, the kid getting older. His name's Leon. Um, he keeps having these strange nightmares. Uh, he saw he saw a hunter named Pepe shoot a squirrel, and it and for some reason he he tells a story about how the squirrel was shot and he licks the blood of the squirrel. And that's what got him all, like, messed up. So he's having these dreams, and at the same time, there's goats and cats and animals around the village that are getting slaughtered. They're getting their throat slashed and everything. So they're blaming the hunter for not doing his job. Uh, the hunter suspects that it's not, like, a normal beast. So he takes his wife's... And this is where the, the sort of mythos of werewolves kind of comes into play. It's in this movie... Uh, he takes his wife's crucifix, silver crucifix, melts it down and makes silver bullets. So he makes those specifically for the uh, the child. But um, the child was actually shot by a regular bullet earlier on, and that's how they kind of found out that Leon wasn't normal, that he actually was, like, a werewolf. So they put bars on his window, and they locked him up, and then that was that. Like, they thought that um, the, the hunter shoots some random dog, and they say problem solved, uh, everyone go home so fast forward to about 20 years late not 20 years he's a teenager now uh, leon's sent off to go work and find his fortune he goes and he works for this uh grouchy old guy that doesn't like him um in a wine cellar um the guy has a daughter and they instantly fall in love it's kind of like love at first sight um either that or the transition's poor because it seems like they meet and then in, like, literally the next scene, they're, like, embracing and they're in love. But the, the daughter, whose name is Teresa, she's engaged to some Don Juan rich douche guy that she obviously doesn't like. So, um, yeah, so they make an agreement that they kind of want to run away together. So um, before that... Before that, Leon goes out with a friend, like one of a workmate, and they go to a place where there's dancing and drinking, and but it's a full moon, so he's kind of like catatonic. He's like out of it, so he leaves. 
this uh, trampy woman finds him and brings him up to his, her his her room, where he they start making out and then he he basically kills her. And a side note, the blood in this movie is really it's like vibrant red. It's like not even like ketchup. It's more like literally like red paint, like red kind of acrylic paint. It's like really fake and not. They use it liberally, but it, it's not it's not effective. It's really fake looking. So then he kills. He, he goes on like a killing spree. He kills the the trampy woman. Then he jumps on his friend, kills his friend. Then he runs all the way back home and he kills the hunter that killed the dog for some reason. And then he goes to his parents' house and he's like, he's flipping out naked in the bed and that's where they find him. So then they, um, they try to figure out what to do with the guy. They say, well, let's send him. The, the sister of, of uh, the father figure is like, oh, send him to a monastery, you know, send him to a holy place and get it worked out of a system. And then like the priest is like, no, lock him up. And he's like, I'm no animal. I'm not going to be chained up. So... He goes back. He tells Teresa, we got to get out of here. Let's go. Um, well, actually, yeah, before that, he finds out that when Teresa's around him, he doesn't transform during a full moon. So I think it's implied that they make this case that love and, like, the good, the goodness of the people's soul keep people, you know, like, normal. So I'm like, okay, is this going to go or I think it's going to go? Well, so um, before they can elope and, like, get wed, the cops come to... The cops come to Leon because they found the clothes that he ditched when he turned into a werewolf. So they accuse him of the murders. So they lock him in jail. So then, uh, then after that, he, uh, yeah, then after that, uh, he breaks out and he, like, there, like there is, he t- doesn't turn into really into a werewolf until like the last ten minutes of the movie. I guess I should just say that basically. That's why I didn't like this movie because they sort of hint at it, they stretch it out, and you don't even actually see him as a werewolf until like the last ten minutes of the film. And and it, it's a it's terrible. It's a, it's just like they don't even try like kind of half-assed Wolfman. So he jumps around in buildings and there's the stock mob for like ten minutes, and then he gets shot by a silver bullet that they left, and then the movie's over. So it, it it's really bad. bad. It's like it, it's the main guy. He overacts. He's hammy. I I personally think he looked like a tan Jerry Lewis with a bowl cut. That that's what I thought the whole time. The guy that played Leon. Lady. And yeah, pretty much. Lady, yeah. I just want to bite you. Overall. <laughs> so Something's I, happening to so my young lady. <laughs> Just look up a pic. I wish I put in a picture to show, but I'm looking at him and it's like, yeah, well, not in wolf form, obviously, but um, I don't know, Oliver Reed. Like, if you take a look at the picture from the IMDb, well, hold on. I don't know if this will be a good picture. I'll just show a few picture that's there, but it's not. It's not the picture from the movie. But uh, get the like, yeah, yeah. So yeah, bad movie. Don't watch. There's mm-hmm. no, there is no way I'm gonna. Finish. You know one interesting thing. Go on. You know one interest, interesting thing that I notice about Curse of the Werewolf is that apparently, it's from, um, it's apparently a Hammer film. So I'm just wondering, yes. was there? So I guess as this kind of film, um, I guess they didn't really emphasize much on the story or characters or stuff like that, and use more like really made it more about, like, the gore and, well, the sex, I guess? Well, okay. It, well, like, it's really they... it's really more about the struggle, like, his inner struggle so much as him. Mm. There is some gore, but it's, like, really brief. And there's no real sex, but it is heavily, heavily implied in this when things go down. Well, like, I, I, well, I guess I meant more, like, nudity or stuff like that, because, like, None normally, at least with the vampire, um... Uh, Hammer films, like they make it like a little bit um, exploitation with it. Like they really try to emphasize like the blood, like make it bright red so that you could see it. Like and like even the wo- even the woman, like they like they barely have they like like clothes are barely are practically repellents to their chest. That's yeah, that's true. The, the cleavage was that's why I mentioned busty. Like if you saw a picture 
of the girl. It was just like it was out there. Like it, it almost makes you question why would they let a girl with her with like her chest sticking out like that go and and uh, and feed a jailer that hasn't gotten any in like fifty years. So that was just asking for trouble. So, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm the only one left, and it might go into overtime just a little bit. Just a little bit, because I gotta, okay. I gotta explain my <laughs> film, and I gotta honorable oh mention as well. God. So, I'm gonna try to wrap it up as fast as I can. If it gets a little lengthy, just uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just a little warning ahead of you. <clears throat> so, same year, 2012, as uh, Wolf Children. I've seen a another foreign film, uh, like the Spanish horror film with English dub. This time, it's a a UK film, a, a English film, as you may say. Um, this is the, this is why I went last because this is this is this is the one that's gonna blow your mind. A uh, little flashback for uh, James and Matt. Uh, episode fifteen was film set in the future. I talked about a film called Zombie Strippers. Uh, if you don't remember, oh, this is telling that. me. Yeah, you told this me. is telling me something. <laughs> You, maybe you'll fill in the blanks if I go on. Um, so that had Robert England in it in a role as a uh, what is it? As, as, yeah, it's like I'm pretty trying, much a pimp for like one of the strip like the strip, strip club owner. Strip club owner. Sorry about that. Hour and thirty minutes is up. I'm gonna go a little further. Um, yeah. So yeah. So it's strippers versus zombies which is another film you can actually watch it's a different film but so i got into another film that features strippers as well strippers versus werewolves mm. oh boy <laughs> why do you pick these movies because <laughs> i like to be a, a little obscure for you guys because uh you guys pick the mm -hmm. classics, and sometimes I have to pick the more obscure films for the viewers to watch. Is that else. what they call it nowadays? Mm -hmm. Obscure. Yeah, oh, it, it is. This... Yeah, but we watched The Killer Tongue together, and you didn't like it. I'm willing to do a second viewing on it, if if you're up to it. I'm willing to take another look at it for a, a upcoming episode, which I'll talk about after the podcast. Um, so, strippers versus werewolves. So, let me tell you that the story is kind of... It, it started out like a very Romeo, Juliet-ish for me, because there's a love story. There's a love story between a stripper and a werewolf. And there's a big feud going on between these strippers and these uh, werewolves. Right away, off the bat... Well, the film is kind of confusing. The film has this weird editing. The editing and the effects are kind of, like, weird. Like, the f first off, you're just introduced to all the strippers and all the werewolves. Like, it showed the face, like, here's Hannah. Here's Joanna. It's like, really, you have to introduce these characters by name only? Not, like, naturally through the film? It's just, well, is that not what they do at strip clubs? Oh yeah, every yeah. time. Oh sure, like you walk in a strip club. Hey, look over there. There's Joanna. <laughs> There's Justice. I'm like, <laughs> it's like a TV. I could say more, but then people would raise questions. <laughs> um. So I was like, okay, why? Why? That's so stupid. And it is it, the basic font you would see in a, in a basic editing software. It's like not like fancy. It's like. Comic Sans? No, no, no. It's like... It's just Comic Sans. Comic Sans. That would be hilarious if it was. <laughs> it's just... This film was edited by, like, an amateur editor. It, I swear to God, because... I mean, there's some points where it's good, but there's some points where they do uh, a filter. You know, the filters where you put, like, a comic book kind of thing. Like, it, it's all shaded in, like, a comic book, and it's like, wait a minute, is this a comic book movie now? Like, what? what what's going on? So meanwhile, or with a picture, it's like, wait a minute, why are you doing meanwhile? Wait, wait, wh what's going <laughs> on? Eh, eh. So the editing is kind of iffy, but the film is quite interesting. So right off the bat, uh, we see that one of the strippers uh, had a client, 
and stabbed him in the eye with a pen. Uh, you you get to know right away it's a silver pen, and it killed the guy who is a werewolf. <laughs> so that starts off, boom, just like that. You're in the plot already. Like Then you see these werewolves and the makeup effects. Okay, let me get into makeup effects, because it's prosthetics. It's actual like, makeup, you see. Um, think of it, the makeup as uh, the Grinch who stole Christmas, the Who's. Uh, kind of the, pros- uh, the, the prosthetic nose is there. You got the ears pointing up, and you got the teeth all. Uh, and they, there's like fur like coming out here and there, and that's that's our werewolves here. They're yeah. There's there's a group. Of... At least now they're intentionally scary. They are. <laughs> <laughs> um. So there, there's a gang. Doctor Seuss's worst nightmare. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a gang of werewolves in London. Of course, it's set in London because it's a UK film. So, werewolves of London. Oh, werewolves of London. So, yeah, there's a, oh, bloody hell. There's a gang of werewolves, and it's led by an alpha male. And there's, it's kind of a, has, a, has like a Three Stooges kind of thing, where there's a guy like, hey, hey, hey there's a woman over there. And there's like a, a wisecracker in there, and there's like the guy that swears like, oi, man. Fuck this shit, I'm gonna fuck her in the head, man. I'm going to fucking bite her head off and all that stuff. You know, that actually sounds less like the Three Stooges and more like the Three Hyenas and uh, the Lion King. Oh, it could be. Actually. Yeah, yeah, actually, I'm thinking... At first, I was thinking the Three Stooges, but eventually it could be the Three Hyenas more when I think about it. I mean, yeah. Um, I guess when when it comes to werewolves, they do... um, I don't know, it kind of has, like, both the... uh, the Wolfman and like the Teen Wolf effect to it, like I guess they come out during the full moon, but um, they often change depending on their um, puberty. The moon, like like puberty, like they're like if they're excited, adolescent, like if they're excited, they turn into a werewolf. Like aroused, oh, like oh, they're hormones. Yeah, they're hormones. Yeah, they're hormones, kind of thing. Because they could change whenever they want, apparently, at night, mm. despite the full moon. I don't know. It's I had to watch it a couple of times to understand that. So, they find out that their fellow werewolf named Mickey uh, <laughs> was stabbed, uh, killed, and these the gang of werewolves are just on the hunt to to uh, avenge the death of his their fellow werewolf buddy. Um. So. The werewolves are on their hunt. Um, the strip owner, the, the, the older lady, she's like, you know what? You guys should know there's werewolves around. So she has like a, a gun with a silver bullet already. Just to say, hey, uh, there's werewolves, so watch out. Um, and he tells the bouncer, hey, you gotta cut them up and throw it away so the werewolves don't come to us, cause there'll be there'll be a war coming. Mm. Um, so. It leads into there's like there's a, there's like a subplot with a love story with a bouncer and a stripper, and there's like a cool part where she actually made silver 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 knuckles for him, not brass knuckles but silver knuckles with his name on it. So you'd be like you could punch Frank. His name is Franklin. So it's like Frank Glenn. So you, oh my god. <laughs> and it's kind of cool. I was like okay okay they might use it in the movie, and she she ends up doing it because. Franklin gets sniffed out by the werewolves, killed, and now eventually they're like, okay. They go to the, the strip club, and they're they're ready to battle, because they're like, you know what, let's just eat everybody. And there's like, so they go to the strip club, they eat everybody, rip them to shreds, there's like, they're like four strippers and the main uh, strip club are left, and the love story between the stripper and the werewolf is that um, apparently there's an awkward sex scene, and I mean, mm. and the way I say awkward is that they it's a sex scene, but they splice in with the editing here. The editing's so weird because they splice in like a what is it like a like a daydream or a flashback kind of montage to it in between the sex scene, and it's filtered blue with the um, films old projector footage filter. And I'm like, mm-hmm. what? Who 
who's editing this film? It's like, is this the old-timey movie we're watching in between the sex scene here? Like, mm. what the fuck is going on? I'm just... So she bites... So she bites him on the shoulder, the werewolf. So apparently, if you bite a werewolf, you have the curse as well. Or as the, or as they say, gift. Because uh, he he, interesting. he doesn't he doesn't bite her. She bites him. It's weird. It's like a werewolf or a vampire thing almost. It's, it's just it's just like, because she's trying to figure out. She's like, she she's not feeling so good and. The main uh, alpha male, like alpha wolves, like to the, because they're engaged, they're fiancés, and they're like, hey, you gotta, if you see fur or teeth, you just, <laughs> and uh, oh, there's like a Mexican standoff where they both find out they're werewolves, and he's got this silver sword, and he's she's got the silver um, bullet gun, and it's like, you know what? They say in a Mexican scant, Mexican Mexican standoff, it's a Mexican. Uh, I got the fucking gun. You better listen to me, or else I'll shoot you. Kind of thing. So the ending is like the most important part because it's the fight between the strippers and the uh, werewolves. So one of the key things about uh, fighting against the werewolves is like, there if there's, I guess they're not good at during daylight so they need natural daylight so the way they uh move over that little thing is that they have uv bulbs for a suntan bed and that kind of makes them not werewolves it makes them back to human mm. so they shine it into his face like you're not a werewolf anymore but uh, you know how i i know that these these are movies that i would never want to see <laughs> It's because just listening to you guys to you guys describe them, it sounds like uh, it it sounds like um, bad lip syncing on YouTube, you know. I just love these bad movies. There's there's this one stri- there's this one stripper who uh, he's he's she's dating this um, a vampire hunter, this like dorky vampire hunter and. He's like all like uh, dorky vampire hunter. Oh, he's like this fat, you know, like me kind of thing, and he's like the dorkiest guy you ever. Not like glasses, but he's just like, uh, I'm like, he's like, you're way out of my league, babe. You're, you're just like, you're so beautiful compared to me. I'm just not this this cool guy. I sure I fight vampires, but I'm just, I'm just not cool for you. And it's like, it's just like really, you gotta stick that guy in there. He's like, he. He comes at the end. He's trying to think of a, a badass line, and he's like, <laughs> as to a reference to a uh, lethal weapon and Family Guy. He's like, he comes in like, it's been revoked. It's just been revoked. <laughs> like, and he's like, oh no no no, that, nobody set me up for that. Um, um it's showtime. It's just like some quirky. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty bad. So, oh god. There's a reference in this movie to the Wolfman as well, as I mentioned before. So, and this is where I get to the Robert England part because Robert England is in this film as well. He has a cameo in this, not a full-length part, but a cameo and he's in prison. And the prison name is H.M. Cheney Prison. H.M. Cheney I know. I don't know why it's H M, but it's Cheney for Lon Cheney Jr. Hmm, Cheney. That's what it is. H M. I get the hmm. Cheney, but I don't know what the H M stands for. It's weird. I don't know. It's hmm Cheney. Hmm Cheney. Cheney. But yeah, you. <laughs> I apparently. I think that's. I think that's that. That's what they did when they thought up of the name. It's like, what, what should we? What should we name the prison? Um. Cheney? Cheney? <laughs> we got it right there. All right, Jeez. so we're gonna call it Cheney Prison. No, 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 no. We need the H. We need the hum. We need to have hum. <laughs> it completes it. So uh, yeah, Robert England makes a cameo, and he's he's got history with the main alpha wolf of the clan werewolves. He's like he he used to be with um, the original crew. You know, he was 
you know, he's in jail for some odd reason, and he's just, the guy's like, you know, you can come out with us, you know, come with the boys, and we can do it like old times, and he's like, y you know what, I'm, I'm done, I'm just, I'm, I'm not gonna do it, you, you do me a favor, you kill that, uh, strip club owner bitch, cause I, I thought she died in a fire that I tried to kill her back then, but she somehow is alive today, and you know what, you do you make her die. You make her die slowly. You, if she's if she closes her eyes, you peel her eyelid off, and make her watch everything die in front of her face. Kind of mm. kill her dead. Just kill her dead. So, like I said, the end is like the most important because it's like the big brawl between the strippers and the werewolves. The strippers have everything planned out. They uh, the same chick who made the um, the silver uh, knuckles. She's the she makes them at this adult education center, as she called it. She goes there and makes stuff. So she makes all these silver bolas. She makes, um, she actually uh, makes the high heels into silver silver heels. <laughs> she uh, there's a the chick who's dating the uh, vampire her. She's got the explosives already, and she's got the um, she's got the subwoofers to make a, a ear pitching sound to make them confused. Um, and by the way, she's badass, by the way, because she actually shoots, uh, the couple of werewolves in the nuts with a shotgun. <laughs> so there's a couple of... But here's the thing about the werewolves, is, like, once they get shot... Wolfman have nards. They have nards. <laughs> here, here, I don't know if this has been developed in other werewolf, werewolf mo movies, but... Uh, once they get shot or exploded, they can dismember themselves and reform. Hmm? I think there was one that did that, maybe, but I don't know which one. But it does. The concept does sound familiar. It's, when it comes, even when it comes to werewolves. Yeah, because uh, I guess there was a like I said, there was explosion fire way back when, and there was werewolves in there, and they must have like if they're exploded, their parts will come back together and be like, oh, brand new. Like I'm back alive. You can't kill it through explosion. But if apparently the way to <laughs> go through that loophole is to put the parts in jars so they don't come together. <laughs> so So he's like the Iron Giant basically. <laughs> the world I don't know. So um there's actually during the werewolf fight and the strippers there's actually a scorecard. So they're, they're like every time a stripper kills a werewolf there's like strippers one, werewolf zero and it keeps going on for each team. I'm just like, what the heck is this? Is this it's like sports there now? Welcome to strippers versus werewolves. We got over here. Justice over here. She turned into a werewolf. She bit off her fiance's testicles off. <laughs> that is like, what is going on? So, spoiler alert: the strippers win. The werewolves are dead. They're not. They don't come back. But, like I said, there's explosive. So they blew up the club, the strip club. And, but how do they come back alive? Are they dead? Are they alive? Well, actually, the female werewolf actually... Oh, I don't know. I guess she kissed one of them, you know, with the blood and kind of transferred the curse onto the other strippers. And now they're all werewolves at the end. So they survived the whole attack because they're werewolves now. So they're werewolf strippers. <laughs> So, are you waiting for that sequel, or... Let, let, it goes on. Uh, the, uh... The uh, vampire, heart, uh, vampire hunter, uh, uh... Boyfriend of one of the strippers is like, You know what, I got a great idea for you guys. And they go off into <clears throat> London, and they're like... Um... There's a scene where somebody comes out of a movie theater watching a movie, and she gets attacked by vampires. Um... And then all of a sudden, these... They, they come out of nowhere and they beat the shit out of the vampires and he's like she's like oh who are, who are you who are you and the guy is like you know what this is a new era cause these are hero werewolves where they fight justice and what? prevent evil from doer, evil doers I'm like what there's the good werewolves, the hero werewolves, where they save the day like superheroes. 
Yay! We'll save that for the Universal Horror Monster uh, Universe. God. It's not... <laughs> yeah. So, I only have one question about this. Why do you even watch these movies, Mike? <laughs> I, I mean, you've been you've been seeing us, right? Our reaction to you talking about yeah, this, we're just yeah. sort of blankly staring, yeah. yeah, trying to look over at Facebook and say, "Oh, what's interesting here?" <laughs> yeah, just I just I love to watch a lot of different movies, and these low budget ish B movies are just interesting to see and in how they're made and how they perceive certain topics and it's interesting to see you know them. mike you know mike you could, you could be completely honest it's because of the first word of the title strippers <laughs> that got yes, you. yes oh that reminds me yes there's a lot of tits in here a lot of tits in here no <laughs> really <laughs> so you think with strippers they they're, they're gonna be in amish clothing yep they're they're some are full t- full nippled and some are taped over. Did the, the werewolves bite any tits nope. during the movie? Or no? Nope. Didn't get that explained. <laughs> no tits were harmed in the making of this feature. <laughs> but this, no, this gets even funnier because there's just one scene and it's the um, the chick with the vampire hunter boyfriend. She's like, you know, want to see these boobs? Sh- shows them off to these clients. And all of a sudden, there's a brief second where they show a drawing of boobs. Huh? Like drawing? Like the okay. yeah, it's like a black and white picture drawing of pic of boobs of her boobs. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> did did did, Why? did 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 she, did she not like agree to show her tits off or something in the film, and they had to draw in a picture to just splice <laughs> in to to see uh, these guys react to it, like... (laughs) Whoa! Check out them artistry! (laughs) Them shadings, yo! Be like, well, we had to hire... We had to hire Matt to work on something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you do the coloring on that, Matt. (laughs) Yeah, do the... Do the shading. You know, find the right skin tone. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll go get lots of reference pictures. <laughs> um, so... In fact, I'm gonna go downtown. I need to get some inspiration. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just turn around and ask Debbie. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. I need to give her a call. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. But yeah, um, I was I was nah, she's on I was on reading the reading the reviews for it. Some people like that's cheesy, yeah, of course, and some even compared it to um, Shaun of the Dead, I believe, where it's like a com- really? a, a, a comedy where it's mixed with you know fighting against a creature of some sort, and some people are like, oh, no, it's not, it's not good. If you're into cheesy movies like I am, it's you, it's on Netflix actually. This is actually where I watched it. The only Netflix movie I've seen on this podcast so far. But yeah, if you're into cheesy movies, strippers, nudity, uh, werewolves, it might be your shtick. But otherwise, just skip it. I'll choose otherwise. Yeah, otherwise. But honestly, I've watched the honorable mention here just briefly. Um... I can't believe you guys haven't even looked on uh, a familiar um, old films of a fellow reviewer known as uh, James Rolfe. Uh, he has made a student uh, a film back in the day of 2001, I believe, called uh... called Kung Fu Werewolf from Outer Space. Yes, I had to sit through a old film made by James Rolfe. Um, hmm. uh, his, oh, that's interesting. It's, the, the concept is very interesting. You, you think about it, it's like, okay, Kung Fu World from Outer Space, it could be a good movie. It's, it's like 26 minutes long, actually. 
Um, so he did edit it with two VHSs, which you can honestly tell, because you can see um, how they f he fades in and out between uh, shots where it's like a white flash, but you can actually see the foreground footage in the background kind of as they transitions. So the story, in a nutshell, is that there's a gay sensei played by Kevin Finn. Finn. Kevin Finn, yeah. Yeah, he plays a gay sensei. And mind you, there's no dialogue in this film. There's very little dialogue besides narration by James Rolfe. So that it's, like, really weird when you're watching it. Like, you're hoping to hear some, like, dialogue in it. But it's, like, all ugh, ugh, grunts and... Like, because of all, there's a lot of fighting in here. So this gay sensei is... He's known for cr training uh, kung fu to these pupils and he's looking for a new one and all of a sudden this spaceship comes down in his backyard or something and it's a werewolf rewind that it's an alien it's an alien who looks like he transformed into it looks like a human being of course because he's got to be budgetary when it comes to these films so it's an alien comes down to earth and he's like the gay sense like, oh, I can train this guy to be in kung fu. You know, he's 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 not accustomed to Earth. You know, I gotta show him uh, TV, fire. I gotta show him everything because he's an alien. There's a montage of that. And then all of a sudden, he sees Bruce Lee's Bruce Lee movies on TV. And he's like, oh, no, 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 oh, 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 oh. and he learns kung fu that way, and through his sensei, his gay sensei. Uh, you know, there's like a kind of a love crushy connection between the alien and the gay sensei. It's kind of awkward watching it. Um, I feel really awkward watching the film. It's just like, really, a gay sensei? Like, why? Because um, everybody loves kung fu fighting! <laughs> so, uh, so, in the woods, there is a werewolf on the loose. Uh, this alien discovers this werewolf so the <laughs> werewolf fights the alien he becomes a kung fu werewolf from outer space and he goes into outer space to fight kung fu against his other alien bullies in a nutshell if you, mm. if you really want to see some early work of James Rolfe and you're curious by the title and just curious to see what this would be like, you can definitely uh, check it out maybe, but if it's not interesting to you, you could just skip it. Um, so, yeah, werewolves, they are my favorite creature. They are, because I love wolves as, as the my favorite animal, but the werewolf aspect is pretty cool, because... Who does love werewolves? I mean, I'm team werewolf over as team vampire, anyways. I know. But this is. I mean, you can tell where. You can tell where I like. Yeah. So this has been episode 39. Next time will be episode 40, our iconic 40th episode. And mm -hmm. we have a themed month in November. We're going from horror to sci-fi. Ooh. So, mm. What do you think of when you think of sci-fi? What's the first thing you think of? Uh, aliens. Space? Aliens. Aliens. Mm. We're going to talk about films featuring aliens or extraterrestrials. Mm. <laughs> okay. okay. Big giveaway there. All right, I got a few. Because there's, there's a known film I like to watch again known as The Killer Tongue. Because it is alien. Am I, am I right? Am I right? So that's, <laughs> yeah. def that's definitely worth talking about. Um, so yeah, this has been Cinema Royale. And I'm going to go check out Wolf's Rain. <laughs> hmm, I, wonder you got, I wonder where you got that idea. Oh, and by the way, as for you people, say it later, dudes. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween.